somewhere in the deep jungle, a lion returned to his cave after a long day of hunting. He was tired, he was, his muscles were aching, and he saw his bed, and he curled into a peaceful slumber, a nice good night's sleep. He earned it. So then there was this spider perching along on top of a rocky ledge. And the spider looked at the lion sleeping. And there's this seed of envy started growing in the spider's heart. And the spider thought, how dare this lion is getting all the attention. He is the king of the jungle. He roams around the plain. He thinks that he can do whatever he wants. I'm going to put an end to it. I'm going to stop him. Tonight is the night I'm going to catch this lion. So the spider started spinning the thickest web he could. He started spinning with remarkable precision. And throughout the night it toiled and made this big, thick web that covers the face of the cave. And towards the end of the night, Spider was very proud of its work and he said, gotcha lion, gotcha. Tonight I gotcha. Morning came. The lion woke up, he stretched his muscles, and he just let out a yawn. Oh, something like this. He didn't even roar, he just yawned. That's all he did. The wind that blew out of his mouth when he yawned was big enough to crush this web to dust. And the Thin, fragile layers of this web, the spider spun the whole week, the whole night, melted away and floating in air. And the lion walked out of the cave without even knowing there was a plot against his life the last night. And this jealous spider was crushed under the feet of the lion. Now this is exactly what happened on Easter Sunday. The enemy cast his biggest net to stop the Son of God from accomplishing his mission. The Roman authorities rolled the weightiest stone in front of that cave and they sealed it with the imperial sign with the chain and all that. Oh, but on the glorious morning, the Lion of Judah roared. <laughs> the stone was rolled aside and the chains melted like wax because nothing could stop the power of resurrection. Now that is the very promise that God is promising us today. Death is swallowed up, that's the phrase. Death is eaten alive, <laughs> as ironical as it sounds. Death is swallowed up, that is the message of Easter. Would you stand with me for reading of two verses, one from the Old Testament and the other from the New Testament. I want you to hear that word, swallowed up. I like that word, swallowed up, eaten alive, kind of. Isaiah 25, verses 7 and 8. And on this mountain he will swallow up the covering which is over all peoples, even the veil which is stretched over all nations. 
He will swallow up death. And the Lord will wipe tears away from all faces. And he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. Another one from the New Testament. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 54 and 55. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Around 400 years before Jesus was born, the great philosopher Socrates was condemned to death by drinking hemlock. You know the story. But before, before he died, he dictated probably one of the most profound philosophical treatise on the meaning of death. This great philosopher is contemplating the meaning of death, which was captured by his disciple Plato, another great philosopher. And it is written in the book called Plato's Apology. It's Socrates' Apology, but it's written by Plato. So in that, this is what Socrates said towards the end of his life, he said, now it is time that we were going, I to die and you to live. But which of us has the happier prospect is unknown to anyone but God. I want to talk about death today. <laughs> because without understanding death, you will never understand resurrection. Even worse, without understanding the meaning of death, you will never understand the meaning of life. So, forgive me. I'm going to take a couple minutes to talk about death because that is the worst fear humanity has. You know, what is fear anyway? What, what are we afraid of? We are afraid of the unknown, right? We, we fear things that we don't know. So we are afraid. Now, what is the worst unknown in our life? Of course, going to a city, we are unknown, so we are afraid. Speak to a person who is not of your kind of inner circle, you are a little afraid because of the unknown. There are a lot of unknowns in our life, but what is the worst unknown in our life? It is death. Because we don't know what's going to happen to us when we die. That's why we are afraid. The worst unknown is death, so the worst fear humanity has is the fear of death. Both animals and human beings die, right? Animals die, humans die too. But here is the difference. Human beings know that we will die. That's the problem. If you are just like animals, we just live and die, that it, it was okay. Animals don't know they will die, but we know that we will die. That is the, that is the difference. So that's why we, our entire human exploration in some way is to conquer this fear of death or having the victory over death. Like Isaiah said, what is behind the veil? We want, to, we want to tear off the veil. We want to see what is on the other side. Then only it will give us meaning. That's why the entire human enterprise is built around our fear of death and our exploration of death. Dr. Shivago, the famous novel, Boris Pasternak wrote this. Quote from Dr. Shivago. Now, what is history? It is the centuries of systemic, systematic exploration of the riddle of death with a view toward overcoming death. That is why people discover mathematical infinity and electromagnetic waves. That is why they write symphonies. 
We don't want to admit, but we are obsessed with the meaning of death because without understanding the meaning of death, we can never understand the meaning of life because death is the negation of all meaning. It doesn't matter how much we accomplish. It doesn't matter how much you earn. It doesn't matter how much you make. At the end of the day, you die. What happens then? Then what is the purpose of living anyway? Now, this is the biggest question. Nobody wants to talk about it, but that is the big question. And we approach science because science is the only known. So, but science basically says that is the cessation of life. That's it. When you die, you just die. That's all. You just finish. You're just finished. Because science lives in the world of empirical proof because nobody has come back to tell us what happened on the other side. So there is no empirical proof. So you cannot blame science for saying that. That's all they know. They say that is the cessation of life. That is the very end. There is nothing after that. Oh, we say, well, there are some near-death experiences, people who kind of died almost and then came back. And, but then, you know, uh, science will disregard it as some kind of hallucinations, right? Some people die and then they feel like they went through a tunnel and they saw Jesus and some people saw Mary. Some people saw Krishna, <laughs> whoever that is, and they came back. And that's, that's mere hallucinations according to science. And I, I, I applaud that observation because that's all they can come out of it because they live in the world of empirical proof. But what happens outside, but what happens inside that curtain? What is beyond the curtain if only we knew? Now the most famous, one of the classic movies, Wizard of Oz, you remember? I'm sure you have seen that movie. And there is this wizard, wicked wizard, who is the authority figure who rules the land of Oz. He is a sorcerer, he manipulates people's perception with tricks and illusion and everybody is afraid of him. But then there's this moment of revelation comes in that movie, Dorothy's little dog Toto goes and pulls back the curtain. And you remember what happens when the curtain is open, then we realize that this wicked wizard we thought was this powerful, fearsome figure was nothing but a fragile old man. He is, he, he is just the weakest possible character you can see in that movie. And the movie ends with that message, not ends with that message, but the movie gives us that message. Pay at no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. That is the message of the Easter. Jesus pulled back the curtain that we are all afraid of, this curtain called death. And he came back with the empirical proof to say that there is nothing behind that curtain. Don't worry about the man behind the curtain. Death is not a cessation of life. It is merely a transition from one reality to another. That's all it is. I remember a while ago, I was on a business trip. I was put in a very fancy hotel in a city I can't even remember, but I was in a top floor and I was looking down the building from my balcony, which was on the corner room. There were two roads, one this way and the other one this way. I'm right in the corner looking down and there's a train station nearby and I saw people going to the train station and many people come to say goodbye to their beloved as they are leaving and they're hugging and they're crying and because they're leaving, you know, all that stuff ha happens and I'm just watching the, you know, I'm people watching <laughs> from the top. And I specifically remember this couple, they were, they, are, they are madly in love, I can see that. Like, you know, they hugged and they loved and then, I mean, they kissed and then, then she has to go to the train station this way and he has to go back this way. And then they, they walked a little bit, they came back again. And they came back, they hugged, and they kissed, they went back, they came back again. They did a couple times. 
because they're so in love and they're so sad that they had to part their ways. And while they were doing, I'm sitting from the, I'm standing and I'm looking at from the top. And for me, they have not gone anywhere. They have not gone anywhere. Well, the boy is this way and the girl is that way. They cannot see each other. But if they look at from my vantage point, they have not gone anywhere. They just merely transitioned from one street to the another, another street. That's all. It is sad that they cannot see each other, but if only they had my vantage point, they would say, that is not the end. We are all ever present in the sight of the man who is looking from above. Now, Easter, God gives us that vantage point. You look at it through the eyes of God to say that death is not the end. It is not the cessation of life, but it is, it is merely a transition from one reality to another. And God gave, gave us on Easter Sunday the real nature of death, which is not a wall. Death is not a wall. It is a door. It is a door for us to enter into another reality. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Do not be afraid of death. That is the message of resurrection. That is the power of resurrection. The great German philosopher who was not a Christian as far as I know, Hegel said this, and I quote Hegel from the lecture on philosophy of religion, he said this, But the death of Christ is the death of this death itself, the negation of negation. Concerning Christ's death, we have still finally to emphasize the aspect that it is God who has put death to death since he comes out of the state of death. What an amazing, powerful Statement, And that's why Paul challenged, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? We are not afraid of you because you are swallowed up by our risen Savior. You are eaten alive. <laughs> Easter is the day death died. Jesus killed death on the Easter Sunday. Poor Socrates, unfortunately, was 400 years early to see that truth. He didn't say it. He didn't say it, but he was fearful of the unknown. He said, this is something unknown only to God. This is only known to God. And he, towards the end of his discourse, he says this, Again, from Plato, I quote what Socrates said. But if, on the other hand, death is a removal from hence to another place, I indeed should be willing to die often if this be true. (laughs) Socrates says, if only I knew the truth Lake Avenue people knew, I would have died every day. (laughs) That's what he says. If only... I knew if only the truth was that it is a transition from one reality to another, I would have died often if this is be true. And 400 years later, Jesus came and proved it is true. Socrates, here is the empirical proof you are looking for. Here is that. I pull back the curtain. Come, come back for you. Here is the transition to another reality. That's why Philippians 1.21 Paul said, oh, for to me to live is is Christ and to die is gain. Exactly the answer to Socrates, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So, my brothers and sisters, as I close, I want you to remember the fact that death is nothing but a jealous spider. You know, in the Dorothy story, when the curtain is pulled back, they see this fragile old man 
And Scarecrow, Scarecrow says, you are a humbug. That's what he says. Dorothy, the Scarecrow tells the man behind the curtain, you are a humbug. Humbug is that good old English word for a corn man, a fraud. <laughs> who uses this manipulations, the tricks and illusions to make yourself so powerful, but you are actually nothing. You are nothing but a con man. Death, you are nothing but a humbug, according to Scarecrow. Death is nothing but a humbug. Death is nothing but a jealous spider. The lion of Judah has risen. He has crushed the enemy to death, and that is the message of the gospel. As I invite the worship team to pray, uh, to back to the stage, I want you to take a couple moments to reflect on that truth. See, I appreciate you walking into Lake Avenue Church on an Easter Sunday morning, and I know it's, many people do Easter Sunday, they experiment church. But this moment could be, could be, could radically change your life. See, I'm not inviting you back to the church. If you want to go somewhere else, that's fine. But don't go just as you came here. I'm making you an irresistible offer. Irresistible offer. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and life. If you believe in Jesus, you will never die. Exactly. The death, what you thought was not death. No, you will only transition from one reality to another and that you can do it right now. You don't have to wait till you die to be in that reality. The eternal life starts right here, right now. Heaven begins right here, right now. That is the message of Christianity. Because he is the resurrection and he is the life. And would you give your life to him? Would you say a prayer? I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I'm not trying to make a spectacle of this, but I just, I, I don't want to waste your time. Please, you are here. You heard something very, very different. Socrates couldn't hear, and, and, and Hegel couldn't understand, but they at least tried to explore the truth of Christ putting death to death. And here, I want you to go with the power of resurrection in your life. God promises resurrection in your family. God promises resurrection in your career. God promises resurrection in the every fiber of your being. And I want you to go with Christ. Would you pray with me as I close in prayer? Our Lord, who are we that you should even consider us? But it is on your grace and mercy and that you whispered the truth, the meaning of death, hence the meaning of life to us. Lord, we acknowledge that we are just fragile human beings. We have our weaknesses. We have committed sins and we have fallen away from the truth, Lord. Here we are coming back to the empty tomb to, tomb to receive the power of resurrection. Please change us. Please transform our lives. It is not about going to church. It's not about being a Christian. But it is, it is about the radical transformation which will automatically bring about all the other things. So, Lord, we want to go back, change. We want to experience the power of resurrection. We want to really undergo that transformation in the mighty name of the Lion of Judah that crushed this, the enemy's web, we pray. Amen.